Our next speaker is Mario Ortega from the University of California, Berkeley. His field is nuclear engineering and his advisor is Rachel Slaybaugh. He did his practicum at Sandia National Labs in New Mexico. Okay. Well, thank you for the, uh, listening to my presentation. I'm going to be talking about a Rayleigh quotient fixed point method for alpha eigenvalue problems in nuclear engineering. I know those are all a bunch of words, and I'll, ex I'll try to explain as I go. So a little bit of the outline, I'm going to motivate this problem. Why do nuclear engineers care about these eigenvalue problems? Everybody cares about eigenvalues, but nuclear engineers in particular really love eigenvalues, right? I'll mention the research objectives of my PhD. I'll describe what it meant to derive a new method to solve a problem that a lot of people know, I think is already sort of understood. And I'll talk about some results and why this matters, right? Why did I get a PhD for it? Um, so modern nuclear reactor designs and experiments require both robust and simple numerical methods for modeling, right? And when I say robust and simple, you might immediately think, well, if it's robust, it can't be that simple. And if it's simple, it can't be all that robust. But that's sort of like the gold standard for our methods, right? The other issue is what works well for some problems might not work at all for other problems, right? There is no silver bullet in algorithms and mathematical methods, and you kind of have to live with that, right? So you need to look at the problem on a, from a physics and mathematical approach and look at what the at what's the best method, right? So what physics tells us might be really good might not work mathematically, and what mathematics tells us might not be obvious intuitively, right? Because we're all tend to, you know, we live in this sort of real world. Um, so maybe you, looking at the structure of the equations gives us a, some clue. So the alpha eigenvalue problem. So the alpha eigenvalue problem is a way to measure the criticality of a system, right? Criticality is defined whether or not a self-sustaining uh, neutron chain reaction is, is possible in, in some system, right? So for a nuclear reactor, you hope so. Um, so the alpha eigenvalue problem is sort of like the red-headed stepchild of, alpha, of eigenvalues in the nuclear community, but recently it's had increased at attention. In particular, there's research in, into accelerator-driven subcritical reactors and pulsed neutron experiments that are used in anything from neutron cross-section measurement to burning of actinites, which, is, which might be one solution to our nuclear waste uh, problem. The alpha eigenvalue problem describes you know, kinetic parameters of of a nuclear reactor. How does this reactor change in time? And what do we expect to happen to the neutron population? Right? Another, another uh, thing that is a particular interest to DOE and the national labs is subcritical assembly experiments, right? Long gone are the days of having critical experiment, building any sort of critical experiment to measure something. So now we look at subcritical uh, um, experiments. How do you actually design these? You know, how do you know what the neutrons do in the system, right? You need to model these and you need to have one parameter and some you know, eigenvector and eigenvalue that tells you something about the physical behavior. So that's the, the motivation. Right? So this is the alpha eigenvalue problem. If, you, you know, if you're familiar with any sort of transport theory, this is just neutrons um, with scattering, uh, fission, and absorption cross-sections. Right? And we define criticality merely by the sign of the, of the dominant eigenvalue. Right? So if the you make this ansatz and you say, I'm going to say that the, the growth of the neutron population is exponential in time. And if it happens to be that, that that number in the exponential is zero, then I call that system critical because no matter what, my neutron population never increases. That's what you want for a nuclear reactor, exactly critical. You can define uh, supercritical and subcritical, right? I can order these eigenvalues based on their absolute magnitudes and this will come into play later on. So what we actually have to consider though this looks great, there's a bunch of integrals and stuff, but we don't actually live in a land where in, in a world where integrals actually make any sense. So instead we have to discretize the, the neutron transport equation and we write this as matrices, right? You do some sort of discretization for your spatial der uh, derivatives, some sort of discretization for your energy variable, some sort of discretization for your angular variable. So you end up with like incredibly large systems of equations that need to be solved and in particular need to be solved for one eigenvalue and one eigenvector. So the objectives of this work were to derive a fixed point method capable of solving subcritical, critical, and supercritical alpha eigenvalue problems. Um, and we initially started in Cartesian geometry because that's easy to actually show you know, some results in. Um, doing what is called diamond differencing in space. It's just a central difference in neutron transport, but nuclear engineering likes to give everything its own special key term. Um, multi-group in energy with isotropic neutron scattering and discrete ordinates in angle approximation. These are all a bunch of assumptions we made in driving the method, but in practice, we actually, these are relaxed and we show that this method works. Um, so consider the following fixed point formulation in equation two. 
you can, if you rewrite this equation one into some sort of fixed point formulation, you can get some uh, this form, right? So why do we pick this specific form? There is a logic to it. In traditional neutron transport codes, you actually never form these matrices because these are incredibly large systems of equations. Instead, all you have is the action of a matrix on a vector. This H inverse, what I represent as an invert matrix inversion, is actually done by a, what's called a transport sweep, where you actually sweep across your domain in space, energy, and angle, and then, and then go ahead and do that, right? So H inverse, what is effectively inverting a matrix, is done through a sort of physical process, right? So we pick this form because we hope that any sort of fixed point method that we derive should be easily and quickly implementable in any sort of production neutron transport code uh, maintained by universities or international labs, right? I will make this claim that the matrix, what I define the matrix A is primitive, right? And I will explain that in a second. So what we're now going into Perot and Frobenius theory for positive matrices, right? If you have a matrix that is positive, every element is positive, then it is guaranteed to have a positive eigenvector corresponding to the dominant eigenvalue. Why do we care about having a positive eigenvector? Well, we're solving for neutron numbers, right? Neutron flux. These better be positive, right? If these make, have any, make any sense, right? So I make this claim that that matrix is primitive and that that positive eigenvector to that primitive matrix is the solution to our problem. And we can back out the eigenvalue from it. And so here I, I, I define a primitive matrix. So let a primitive, uh, let a B be a non-negative irreducible matrix. Now I'm mentioning irreducible, right? All irreducible means is that we're solving the smallest possible system for our phase space, right? I can, I, I will appeal to your intuition by saying a system that is reducible is a system, for example, that it consists of two slabs where uh, neutrons exist and a slab in the middle that is perfectly absorbing. If you were to solve that numerically and write that a linear into, into a matrix form, there is absolutely no need for you to solve that system completely globally, right? Because there is no interaction between the two slabs. That is a reducible system. Irreducible is, is just defined as not being reducible. Um, and so from Perot and, Ferbi uh, Perot and Ferbini has showed that these primitive matrices have a guaranteed positive eigenvector and corresponding to, uh, corresponding to that is an eigenvalue, which we're gonna, we're gonna back out. And so let's see if this animation works. So the way a neutron transport code does is you have the scattering uh, cross-section sigma s. And this is going to become the right-hand source of your equation. You go ahead and add in then your fission source. Um, so now this is going to be the source on the right-hand side, and you're going to invert this to find the new uh, flux iterate. So in their fixed point formulation, I actually perturb it by this alpha v inverse, where v inverse is a velocity matrix. Um, so this is a right-hand side, and then I, I hit it from the left side with a uh, H inverse. My transport code just goes ahead and sweeps given some right-hand source. It doesn't care about the source. It just sweeps along it. I want to make the claim that a primitive, the, a primitive matrix is defined at, if there is some exponent n such that that matrix is all positive. What I want to see here is that where there is blank spaces, this is a sparsity plot, um, it will fill in, right? And I actually make a claim that it's two, and it can be showed by, for one-dimensional slab geometry, giving all the assumptions that there is this uh, exponent two, that this neutron transport equation discretization scheme ends up becoming all positive, right? So this matrix is primitive, right? So now we can assure the existence of the positive eigenvector and do that, right? But before I go ahead and um, describe my method, I want to do what's been done before, right? So uh, Los Alamos and Livermore have developed a method that's called the critical search method. And what the critical search method does as a way to find the alpha eigenvalue method, it actually leans on another eigenvalue problem, the k-effective eigenvalue problem. If you're a nuclear reactor physicist, k is just basically a, multipl a multiplication constant that forces your problem to be exactly critical. So you make an initial guess for alpha, usually set it to zero, and then you solve for the k-effective of a system. You go ahead and make another guess for alpha, and then you resolve for the, uh, for the k effective of the system. And then you do some sort of linear inter interpolation to find the, the alpha such that k is equal to 1, such that your system is exactly critical, right? Immediately, you can tell that if I want to solve one eigenvalue problem, I have to go ahead and solve another eigenvalue problem, possibly multiple times, right? It's incredibly expensive. Um, so let's avoid that. This method also struggles for subcritical problems if you see on, do I have a pointer? No. If 
you see on the left hand side of the equation, the alpha, there's an alpha term in there. Alpha can possibly be negative, right? And if it's substantially neg if it's negative enough, it introduces what is called a negative absorption, which is not physical and actually, um, and actually causes problems to your system. So you can't, um, so that should be avoided, right? The method also requires guessing. And anytime you let a user guess, that could get you into trouble, because a really bad guess can devastate the ability of a method to converge. We should also avoid that, right? The method is also incredibly slow, because you have to solve a preliminary eigenvalue problem multiple times. Let's, you know, like, let's avoid that. And so this is sort of what this convergence behavior for this method looks like, where the orange line is the other is the k-effective eigenvalue solver, and the blue is the uh, alpha eigenvalue solver, right? So you're doing a lot of work for not a lot of iterations of alpha. So if we go through a fixed point, if we go back to thinking of it as a fixed point, how do we actually do this, right? And so the idea is very simple in hindsight. Um, if psi and lambda are an eigenpair, then this fact follows immediately, right? So instead, suppose we are, try to minimize um, the update in the least square sense. And um, in the least square sense, oh, there's an update. Um, and when you solve for this factor mu, you actually, you actually get the Rayleigh quotient, hence the Rayleigh quotient part of the algorithm. And since we are looking for the positive eigenvector that solves this fixed point formulation, implicit in this eigenvalue problem is that the eigenvalue is actually equal to one, right? Set that Rayleigh quotient equal to one, and then solve back out the alpha eigenvalue through you know, some m manipulations. And you end up with an algorithm that lets you directly calculate the alpha eigenvalue based on your current uh, eigenvector iterate. Um, and this is just the, for, um, this is just the uh, algorithm. And this is very easily implementable in existing transport codes. And we did this um, in Livermore. Um, some basic results. We looked at 1D results. We, if it works for 1D, like if it doesn't work for 1D, then I just, we did nothing, right? Um, and we found that the Rayleigh quotient method you know, reduces the number of iterations required by up to a factor of 10 in a lot of circumstances, and actually converges problems where the critical search method fails to, uh, fails to converge, right? So we're not only solving problems faster, we're solving problems that the previous method couldn't solve. Um, these plots, which are hard to see in this, um, just show that, you know, by basically making the alpha, the Rayleigh quotient method agnostic of any other eigenvalue problem, I immediately get massive performance gains. And this is sort of like one of the better you know, results. Um, take a, a mixed oxide uh, fuel assembly, um, which is a very hard problem to discretize, right? Requiring um, a lot of discretization in space and energy and in angle, and try to calculate what is effectively just one value, the alpha eigenvalue. And in this particular case, we require, it, the critical search method requires almost 9,000 inversions of H, that is transport sweeps. And each transport sweep is very expensive for this problem since you have to sweep through the entire phase space. The Rayleigh quotient method reduces that by a factor of about seven, right? And it's, you know, we get these beautiful scalar flux plots. These are all positive. These are the, the, these are the parameters that uh, users want, what designers want when they're designing an, a fuel assembly. And I just want to show, you know, the, the critical search method does a lot of work for very little gain at each step. And the Rayleigh quotient method, being a fixed point nonlinear method, just immediately finds the fixed point and converges linearly. Um, on my last slide, um, I do want to talk about failure, right? Because one of the more interesting things about methods is when do they fail, right? And we, it, from the literature, there was this method where all the alpha eigenvalues are on, the uni on a unit circle, right? So in this particular case, what happens is the fixed point, this is, the cross sections aren't physical. In this particular case, what happens is the Rayleigh quotient method is that the Rayleigh quotient method actually cycles through every single alpha eigenvalue with a period of 81. Well, guess how many group, energy groups this particular problem has. There is, this is infinite medium with no angular dependence, so it's only a function of energy. There's 81. So the condition of primitivity is important, though not necessarily sufficient as we've shown in other cases. Um, <coughs> So in conclusion, we have developed an alpha eigenvalue Rayleigh quotient fixed point method that's able to solve the, uh, for the eigenpair of subcritical, critical, and supercritical systems. Um, we show that we have a mathematical proof that shows that the discretized transport equation actually forms a primitive system of linear equations. Nobody wants to see your proof in slides, but it's, uh, it's actually quite, it, I'm quite proud of it. <laughs> <laughs> 
and it's and it's only a page long because everything in math is so obvious in hindsight, right? But this took years. Um, and using primitivity, uh, using by leveraging the properties of the matrices themselves, we can actually guarantee the existence of what we're looking for, which is important, and then we can find a clever way to get it back out. Um, so I want to take a uh, special thanks to Peter Brown, Brittany Chang, and Teresa Bailey, and the rest of the Liv Lawrence Livermore people. Uh, I worked closely with them in the development of this method. Um, and the research is supported by the uh, CSGF uh, Fellowship. Thank you. I really appreciate for you to letting me take a risk and letting a nuclear engineer go into like super heavy HPC and math work that I never expected to do four years ago. Um, and I also need to mention that this work was performed under the auspices of the US Department of Energy by Lawrence Livermore National Labs. And thank you for your time, and thank you for everything. Any questions?